Marie. I'm uh, Rachel Abair, and I am the Health Initiatives Program Director um, at ODC. And I oversee the Healthy Dancers Clinic. And um, Libby Parker is one of our volunteers um, with the Healthy Dancers Clinic. Um, she'll have to fill you in on how many years she's been volunteering with us. Um, but we're very fortunate to have her. She has her master's in science. She's a registered dietitian, along with a number of other certifications that um, she has acquired over the years. Um, she is a um, theater actress, musical theater actress, and um, she also has her own company called Not Your Average Nutritionist. Um, she has written some books. Uh, she's an author and she's also working on some new books. And um, everything around uh, nutrition. Um, and uh, I love the title of her book, Permission to Eat. Um, so really excited to hear uh, what she has prepared for today. Um, and I, I know I'll have some questions. And Marie, if you have any questions, feel free to dive right in as well. Okay. So, Libby, excited to have you. And please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I've been volunteering with ODC for, I think, three years now. Um, it was before the pandemic because I came up for, like, a really big event that we did during the month of Dancers Health. And then the last two years have been Zoom presentations like this. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I started a little presentation. Uh, let's make that go away. Okay, so I'm going to just go through a couple of slides, but Marie... If things are not relevant to you, just let me know and we're going to skip it. <laughs> and I want to get to your question specifically. Uh, uh, All right, let's see. Okay. So yes, as Rachel said, um, there's a few things about me. So I started dancing when I was, well, this picture is when I was one and a half. I had my first tap shoes. My mom danced, not professionally, but she loved dance and theater and introduced me to musicals early and got me into dance. I think I officially started classes when I was three um, and I did, I've done dance most of my life as an adult on and off this last, you know, year and a half has been basically off and I just got back into tap, but done a little bit of everything, um, especially love musical theater. That is my jam. That is my passion. Um, but rather than uh, going into that profession, so when I was 18, I had zero self-confidence. Uh, I went into the sciences because that's what my family was like. You should get a, you know, a real career you know, speaking to dancers, like, no, that's a real career. You, you can be a dancer or actress or whatever, and that's a career. But I uh, went into sciences, ended up uh, becoming a registered dietitian, and just kind of along these lines with what's on the screen, I used to be a certified personal trainer and a group fitness instructor. So I did that for a while. So I have a good understanding of exercise from, you know, the anatomical physiological aspect, as well as just moving my body through dance as I have. Um, when Rachel, when you were saying my company, I was thinking like, oh, to dancers, that might mean dance company. No, I have a uh, business, a group practice of dietitians, and we work primarily with eating disorder recovery and sports nutrition. I personally work with stage performers as well. And so I am a certified eating disorder registered dietitian. I also in the theater realm. I write for publications like Backstage as a health expert, Onstage blog. Um, I do um, stage and film acting. I wrote a book. So that's just kind of a quick overview of me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through these questions that I was sent ahead of time um, just because we're recording this. So if anyone wants to watch this in the future, they have that. Um, but I really do want this to go into what you want. So if you have follow-ups to any of these questions, if I didn't make something clear, please speak up. Um, you can pop stuff in the chat, but let me know something went into the chat um, because I can't see it at the moment. And I'll have definitely lots of time for questions at the end. So this question came up and it's, I don't eat before I go to rehearsal or class because I'll feel nauseated if I do, but then I'm starving after rehearsal and want to eat everything. Is this normal? And is there something I should do instead? Okay, so the feelings associated with this are, of course, normal, because if you don't eat for a long time, of course, you're going to be starving and want to eat everything. That's the body's response. But what we want to look at is really how to 
fix this for lack of a better word. So just on a very general, broad spectrum, if we're just looking at human beings, whether or not we're dancers, we want to generally be eating every two to three hours that we're awake, not going more than five hours without eating. So when we're thinking of this with dance or any sort of performance sport, you know, if someone is a runner, whatever, it's really helpful to get to know your body and your digestive system and trying out different types of foods, amounts of foods and timing before your classes or rehearsals or performances to see what is really working for your body. Okay, another one. So when we're looking at specifically performance, this is kind of what the general rule is. You want to eat a meal. So all of our components, which we'll talk about a little bit more coming up, half an hour to two hours before the performance based on your individual body preferences. So for some people, they have no digestive issues, no nausea, they can eat, you know, half hour before, like right before they get into costume, they're great, cool, that works for them. Other people are a little more sensitive in their stomach or they get, you know, the pre class or show jitters and that, you know, causes anxiety or nausea, or, you know, if they have IBS or something like that, it could be, you know, moving that meal back to two hours before. And if they can tolerate it, having a snack, maybe that half hour before, just because we really want to have energy in our body before we're moving. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more coming up too, but it's very, very important that we are fueling ourselves and having ready available energy in our system before we're moving, whether it is a class, a performance, um, daily life. It's like putting gas into a car. If you don't put gas in the car, it's not gonna go. If we don't put food in the body, it's not gonna go or go at its best. So that's how I like to think of that. This is a quote from one of my favorite dancer dietitians. So if you are looking for someone who works only with dancers and specifically ballet dancers, Emily Cook Harrison is fabulous. Uh, she says, staying at a strong and yes, competitive weight requires frequent meals and snacks. When an athlete or dancer goes too long without eating or restricts energy calorie intake, the body actually lowers the metabolic rate and breaks down muscle in order to turn the amino acids mm -hmm from that muscle into fuel. So starving the body results in less muscle, lower metabolic rate, and higher percentage body fat. Plus the dancer is more fatigued and has less energy to work. Mm -hmm. So let's just break this down a little bit um, because I think you know we can take it at face value and it, it speaks for itself. But if we wanna go in a little more depth here, if someone is not eating enough food overall calories for their body needs and they're not eating frequently enough to have that kind of constant trickle of nutrients in to keep the fuel going in at a constant rate we're going to slow down metabolism which means on a more superficial level um, we're going to have you know lower resting metabolic rate and that's going to mean that more food that we eat is going to get converted to body fat versus used for energy intake. And if we're also, you know, the long-term effects of eating too little food, even if it's too little by a small amount, will actually result in breaking down our muscle. So we're not only drawing from uh, carbohydrate and fat reserves when we're in a caloric deficit, we're also pulling from muscle. So that means breaking down muscle and like most people think of first um, skeletal muscle. So like the muscles that, you know, power us through, you know, our jetes and all of that stuff, but it's also the muscles of our organs. So our heart is also breaking down, which means our, it, our heart is not able to pump blood as effectively through the body, slowing down, um, mm -hmm. causing other um, medical issues as well as, you know, all of our other muscles in our body. So that's obviously a problem. And then, you know, even assuming that's not happening yet, if we're not 
eating enough or frequently enough that we're um, giving our body the fuel it needs to do this exercise, dance or otherwise, we're going to be more fatigued. And that is going to have a direct impact on our abilities. We're not going to dance as well. We're not going to have as much energy and as much fun. We're not going to be able to do the more complicated things um, as easily. We might not be able to work up to doing complicated things. So it really does come down to how are we taking care of our body before we even hit the dance floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question. And again, if you have more specifics on these, um, please ask. Some of these are, are pretty similar questions. So I'm gonna kind of add on to them as we go. <laughs> I need some more water too. Okay, so this question. Between work, school, and rehearsals, I don't have a lot of time to eat healthy. This, I feel like this is a very common <laughs> statement right there. Uh, my choices are eat something quick and easy, which is usually high in calories, fat, and carbs, or don't eat at all. I know neither is good. How can I overcome this? So I like that this person already understands I know neither is good. <laughs> so it's not saying like, oh, yay, I don't eat at all, because that is a frequent problem I see. Um, so we have some things to help work on this. And kind of my, my initial thoughts are, we can go into more depth, planning ahead, eating on the go, and something is better than nothing. So when we're looking at, you know, something quick and easy, which is usually high in calories, fat, and carbs, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Our, again, what we just talked about, dancers need calories, fat, and carbs. These are rather important to our function. Uh, and if it's something where they're afraid that they're eating too much for their individual needs, that might just be more of a portion issue. Like you can literally eat any foods. I, you know, I have eight years of higher education and nutrition and there are no bad foods. You can eat them all. Like the only thing I will ever tell anyone not to consume is energy drinks. And if you have questions on that, we can go into it, but literally any food is okay and can fit into a healthy diet. So if it's something where they're afraid that they're just eating too much on a regular basis, that might be more of a portion problem than anything. Um, but I think a lot of this, because, you know, they're saying work, school and rehearsals. Okay. Busy schedule. We get that. We know that lots of people have that problem. And it is something where you do need to put in the time to plan ahead as best as possible. This is not going to look perfect. And we're going to talk about some more resources to make planning ahead a little bit easier uh, in some upcoming slides. But taking a little bit of time to plan enough that you have a general idea of some foods that you can make, maybe doing some batch cooking, you know, using um, a slow cooker or something, or just, you know, having a, a set meal prep time during the week can be really helpful. Or if you can afford it, purchasing a bunch of foods that are already prepped. And it can be as simple as like, you know, buying a rotisserie chicken and buying some pre-cut fruits and vegetables and like having it. So you just kind of plop stuff together and it's set to go. It, it doesn't need to be fancy, take a long time to make. Um, it really can be as simple as your funds allow, <laughs> basically. Um, but just really thinking ahead and, you know, grocery shopping with a plan. So coming up with an idea of, you know, meals and snacks that you want to have for the week putting that onto a grocery list. So you're buying things that you're actually going to be able to use so that they're ready to go and having them as grab and go as possible. Um, if people want, we can talk about more specifics, but I'm thinking even things like, you know, overnight oats or, you know, throwing a protein, a carb, a vegetable and a fat into a container to go with you. So that could be like, you know, like I said, like, the rotisserie chicken, some veggies, a sauce, and some grains. Like that could be a meal on the go. Um, if you're 
traveling around to all of these things or like so many people right now are sitting in front of the computer. Are you okay with eating, you know, during class or during work? Um, hopefully people are getting, you know, meal breaks or some sort of break um, during, you know, work or school or rehearsal. So, you know, shoveling a little bit of food in during that time, it, it might not be the most beautiful, the most mindful experience, but sometimes you just have to do good enough. And eating is more important than not eating. So that's also where the something is better than nothing. So I would rather, you know, these people eat anything that they can get their hands on rather than not eating at all for all the reasons that we just talked about. Any questions on this? Nope. <laughs> awesome. All right, Rachel, this is the question I said I might get a little snarky on. <laughs> so, um, okay. This answer says, I'm trying to stick to a low carb diet to maintain my weight. My energy levels have felt so low at the end of class. So I'm trying to eat more protein, but it doesn't seem to help. How much protein should I be eating? Okay, a lot to unpack in this question. Uh, first of all, without knowing the person speaking, uh, how much protein should I be eating? I can't answer that question. Um, technically, there are ways to calculate this, but we're not going to go into that today because I think we're missing the main point of this question. And that is this dancer, this endurance athlete is trying to stick to a low carb diet and is feeling low energy. Okay. Why is this a problem? Um, so if we are eating adequate calories for our individual needs, carbohydrates should make up 45 to 65% of that. And dancers should be on the higher end of this range. So 55 to 65% of our daily intake in terms of calories should be coming from carbohydrates. Why? Well, we're literally getting our energy from carbs. And this is not unique to dancers. This is how humans function. You know, this 45 to 65% is for humans. This is not specific to dancers. That's why dancers, are, as I said, are on the higher end of this range, but literally the majority of what any human should be eating should be coming from carbohydrates, which is why all of these low carb diets drive me and other dietitians up the wall because they don't make sense. <laughs> um, so before I get into these other points on this slide, I actually want to talk about why these diets exist, uh, these low carb diets, and why that's a problem. So when people go on a low carb diet to lose weight, the reason that these low carb diets work, and I say work in quotes because they, you know, get some weight off initially, is it's primarily a loss of water weight. So carbohydrates bind to water molecules in the body, which keeps us hydrated. This is a very good thing. We want to be hydrated, especially again, as athletes, as dancers, we want to stay hydrated. Very, very helpful. But when we remove the carbohydrates or reduce them greatly in our diet, that means the water molecules don't have those to attach to, and we very quickly pee them out. And so that's why if you've ever gone on a low carb diet, usually that first couple days, you see a drastic weight loss in, you know, several pounds. And this is not fat. This is not like what people are, you know, trying to lose weight from. This is literally water, which is going to make you feel dehydrated, cranky. You're not going to have energy. You're going to have brain fog. Um, but you get on the scale and you're like, yay, I lost weight. It's working. So they stick to it. And very quickly, this diet doesn't continue to work as effectively because once you've lost that initial water weight, the weight loss slows down and any additional weight loss beyond that is typically because people are eating fewer overall calories because they're not eating their favorite foods. So it sounds like a pretty miserable way to live. You're cranky, you're dehydrated, you're in brain fog and you don't get to eat your favorite foods. None of that sounds appealing to me and it's really not great for your body. Why are these things happening in our body? Well, the energy piece of it is we have a storage form of carbohydrate in our body called glycogen. 
The glycogen is in our liver and muscle cells, and it is a short-term storage of carbohydrate molecules that when we are in need of energy, whether for movement or breathing or using our brain power, anything that we're doing, uh, it's very easy for our body to pluck some carbohydrate molecules out of these glycogen chains and convert them to energy. It's much simpler than breaking down fat, so our body prefers to use glycogen. We're never only breaking down carbs or only breaking down fat as our fuel source throughout the day. They're both running simultaneously all the time. But glycogen is the thing that keeps us going when we're in our endurance activity. So you're in a long rehearsal, you're in a long performance, you're out on a run, um, you have to continue pushing through general work or school without a break for a meal. Glycogen is a thing that's keeping you going. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we have this. And this is coming from having continuous sources of carbohydrates coming in. Now, on the other side of this, because low carb diets have that initial weight loss, which gets people all excited, they assume, well, if I'm eating less carbohydrate and eating more protein, because comparatively, if this percentage is shifting, then you probably are eating more protein or with like keto diets, you're eating more fat, which don't even get me started. Please don't do that. Um, eating more protein will not make you lose weight. It'll just make you more malnourished. Oh, so let's go into why that is. <laughs> I love that I'm hearing a little bit of laughing. So thank you. Um, okay. So proteins should make up about 15 to 30% of our intake, similarly to how our carbohydrates should be 45 to 65%. And I would say some sources even take this down to 10% to 30%. So it can vary. And for the same reasons that dancers are endurance athletes and need more carbohydrate, they're going to be on the lower end of protein. So why is this causing you know, more potential, like not, not necessarily causing more weight gain, but not making you lose more weight and it'll make you more malnourished. Well, it's not going to be used for energy unless that's the last resort. This protein is being used for repairing everything. So repairing all of our body tissues, it creates hormones, it regulates the fluid balance in our cells, um, helps us with our hair, skin and nails, allows our heart to beat, like so many things are happening beyond skeletal muscle, you know, like a bicep or something like that. So protein has a lot of things it needs to go do. So in that same vein of carbohydrate being our quick source of energy and fat kind of constantly being broken down, protein is not going to be used for energy unless those other sources are already used up. So we're not really seeing protein used for energy, for you know, movement to get through your day, unless you're already malnourished and you're not eating enough carbohydrates and fat and your body is very low on those. So what we see is with people who are malnourished, not eating enough food, they're breaking down their muscles. And so you're not going to have the strength, the energy, the power behind your move. So that seems like a pretty poor idea for a dancer, uh, as well as, you know, medical complications and quality of life. But if we're just looking at performance, it's, it's not a good idea. Um, and similarly, having too much protein in the diet without enough calories overall is not going to help with building muscle because same reason, if we're not getting enough calories to meet our energy needs, then the protein will have to get broken down for energy. So we need to make sure that we're getting like my number one thing, every client I see, we need to make sure, are you eating enough is my very first goal with someone. Mm -hmm. How, like, if we're looking at overall amounts, calories, all this stuff, are you eating enough to meet your needs? And then we can get into the macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins. And once we get those sorted out into appropriate amounts and timing through the day, then we can start looking at micronutrients and our vitamins and minerals. And then we can start looking at specific foods 
if it comes down to that. But if you're not eating enough, nothing else really matters. Then why is there so much of an obsession of the high protein diets? Mm -hmm. Because people don't understand science. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I mean, that's my quick answer. I, I honestly don't know because I feel like they, they don't work that well. And if we look at kind of the history of trends of dieting, it seems like every 10 years or so, there's a new like villain. So if you remember in the eighties and early nineties, no one was eating fat, like no fat, all the carbs. That was how we were going to lose weight. That didn't work. So then they vilified that. And now we're on high protein and I'm pretty sure protein is going to be the enemy in the next one because we're creating so much damage with it. So these just cycle through. And I think if people learned how to actually have a good relationship with food and eat a balanced diet, they wouldn't need to vilify a a nutrient because there wouldn't be a problem. I I think protein, the high protein diets, because we do see that quick weight loss, people think, oh, well, maybe I'm not doing it right anymore if I'm not continuing to lose that fast. So they try harder. And I mean, if you get into enough of a calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight. It's not healthy. It's not necessarily good for your body, but and it might not necessarily be permanent. Yeah, it's probably not. I mean, the research has definitely shown that 95% or more of diets fail. And by fail, it means that the dieter will regain the weight they lost, usually plus some within five years. So every time you go on a fad diet and you go below your body's needs, you lose some weight, inevitably you, you know, fall off the wagon or however you want to say it. And your weight goes back up to typically pretty close to your starting weight, maybe gaining a little bit more if you've really screwed up um, your relationship with food and your metabolism. Cause I think we talked about, um, somewhere back here, we were talking about metabolism. I don't know where it went. Um, but we can lower our metabolism. So then every attempt to diet after that requires fewer and fewer and fewer calories. Um, even though your body might still be malnourished, but you're going to gain weight more easily with each diet. If that makes sense. So yeah, it's basically anytime someone goes on one of these, you know, so-called quick fix weight loss diets, they're setting themselves up to be dieting for the rest of their lives to maintain this desired weight loss. That's probably not appropriate for their body if they have to work that hard at it. So that's how, you know, the diet industry is making all of this money too, because people are like, oh, well, it was my fault that I couldn't keep the weight off. So if I, you know, work harder, if I buy the special foods that they produce for this diet, then it'll probably work this time. And we keep going and it, you know, ruins the body image. Most diets, or I don't know if I say most, I can't remember what the actual statistics are, but uh, a precursor to most eating disorders is dieting. So it could start out with an innocent, oh, I, you know, I gained some holiday weight. I'm going to try to get that off, or I'm just going to eat a little bit healthier. I'm going to have apples instead of cookies. Like it can start off with those, you know, essentially like we would say healthy ideas, but a lot, you know, most eating disorders start as a simple getting healthy kind of thing like that. So they can really snowball and, that is going to ruin your relationship with food for, you know, a long period of time, assuming that you um, get help and recover and it will probably mess up your metabolism and medical issues, mental health issues, body image issues. So my, my whole messaging in life is please don't go on a diet. Don't go on a fad diet. If it has a name, don't do it. Uh, the other thing with protein is, I, mean, I have so much I could say on all of these things. <laughs> I want to keep it kind of short, but it is really fascinating because too much protein in the long term. So if you're eating too much protein on a regular basis, it will create damage to particularly your liver and kidneys. 
So we see, um, you know, renal failure in people who have been on like long-term, like super paleo diets or just super high protein diets. And no one's talking about that when they're like, oh, I'm going to go paleo or I'm going to go high protein because most people don't stay on the diet for a long time. But those that do are, I would just assume not wanting to talk about it, or maybe they got too sick and they didn't realize that was the problem. Who knows? We don't really know what that is, but we do know the effects of too much protein from whatever cause uh, will create issues because our, our body really wants to be in balance with the way that it was intended to be fed. I feel like it's something else about protein too. Let me think. Oh, what's the other thing? Oh, I know what the other thing is. Um, so I think another common misperception is, um, you know, more protein is better in terms of like on a meal to meal basis. So like I see a lot of people and I, I think of this stereotypically with like guys who want to gain a bunch of muscle and bulk up and things, but I've literally seen this run the gamut of people um, having a ton of protein at their meals or snacks, like major protein shakes or a couple of protein bars, or they'll have, you know, all the protein foods, whether or not they're eating the other nutrients, um, just too much protein. And the human body can't really utilize more than give or take 30 grams of protein in a sitting. So at our typical meal or, you know, every several hours, having more than 30 grams of protein is not going to give you any more benefit. And that is where it's actually going to lead to more fat gain. So if we look at how food is processed through our body and where it goes, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of the digestive process here. So uh, we eat food, goes down our esophagus, not much is happening there, it goes into the stomach where we add in um, acids and, um, oh my gosh, peptides and enzymes and things that are breaking apart the food, uh, both chemically and mechanically through the churning of our stomach to get it into single molecules. And then all of that food in kind of liquefied form goes into our small intestine. And this is where the majority of absorption is taking place. So then the single molecules get absorbed through the intestine wall. They go into our bloodstream. And when they're in our bloodstream, they travel all over our body and they get dropped off at cells wherever they're needed. So our first purpose of all of these food molecules is what cells need what and what do they need right now? So let's say, you know, this cell needs some carbohydrates, this cell needs some protein, this cell needs some fat. They get, you know, placed around. And then any extra is going to get stored. So our first, for carbohydrates, um, our first storage plan is that glycogen that we talked about. Um, so remember our quick energy storage in our liver and muscle cells. So if we have excess carbohydrate that isn't used right away, we're going to put it into glycogen storage. Um, but that has a finite amount. It caps off somewhere around 1500 calories worth of glycogen storage within our body. And then anything beyond topping off that tank is going to get stored as fat. Any excess fat is going to get stored as fat and any excess protein is going to get stored as fat. So if we're eating more protein than we need for our immediate needs, it is going to get stored as fat. So when people are having these huge protein shakes or meals thinking, oh, this is going to bulk me up and get my muscles really strong or, you know, whatever their thing is, well, it might bulk them up in other ways, but it's not doing what they intended. It's not going to give them more muscle. It's not going to give them more um, energy per se. It's going to get stored as fat, which you know will get used as energy over time, but it's not what most people's goal is. So I think that's all I have to say about protein. More questions? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, actually, not about protein, mm-hmm. but carbs. I've heard carbs. I should know this, but I get confused all the time. Carbs, it's referred to uh, when you're eating pasta, because I used to be a runner. It was like carbs, but also carbs are vegetables, right? So is it both of them or should we eat? I'm always, I'm thinking we should have less of the pastas and the breads and more of the vegetables. Is that Uh, accurate? (laughs) There's a lot of questions. (laughs) Um, Correct. They are all carbohydrates. So when we're thinking about um, here, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a minute so I can look you in the eye while I <laughs> answer the sparks. It's not in there. Um, so when we're looking at carbohydrates, they're in most foods. So carbohydrates are in, yes, any like grains or starches. So pasta, bread, potatoes, um, tortillas, chips, pastries, cereals, rice, like any of that kind of stuff. They're also in fruits and vegetables. They're a primary component of those. They're in nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, dairy. Um, that's kind of the majority of like, you know, uh, categories. Um, the difference is so when we're looking, when we're saying carbohydrate, we mean the carbohydrate molecule. This is where it gets really really complex and scientific, but essentially all of those count towards carbs and they're all healthy and we can include them. When we're breaking it down into like how it's actually being utilized in our body, um, carbohydrates are typically thought of as like these complex long chain molecules. And that's where there's differences. So we have um, fibers, we have soluble and insoluble fiber, we have starches, and then we have um, single sugars or um, two sugar molecules together called disaccharides. So those are kind of our different categories. So how they all fit into our food, all of the different types of carbohydrates will break down to single molecules of sugar. So whether it is coming from an apple, from pasta, from celery, from our table sugar, it's going to break down to individual molecules of carbohydrate. And that is what goes into the chemical process in our body to create energy. So I feel like I, I don't want to get like too, like too much, like a super scientific lecture, but I feel like you're, you're liking it. So, uh, so there are three single sugar molecules that exist, <laughs> uh, glucose, fructose, and galactose, I believe. Um, and so then those get put into chains and that makes up these other things. And the way both in terms of like which molecules they're put together and then the way in which they connect and whether they, you know, branch a lot or if they're more like single chains, that determines the type of carbohydrate they turn into in like actual food rather than just a single molecule. So if we're looking at like table sugar, it's usually um, two single sugars together. So it's a disaccharide. Um, So there's no fiber in that, but it will break down very quickly into those single molecules. So uh, like you're saying with being a runner, did you ever like on long runs use like the gels or chews or have a banana or anything? Uh, banana. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our, the closer we can get to those single sugars, the quicker it's going to hit our bloodstream and give us that energy and top off our glycogen or our immediate needs. So that's why in endurance activities, we want those simple sugars when we're on the go, because we don't have time to wait for our body to process it. Cause it can take a long time to break down these really complex carbohydrates. We want that quick energy um, in our system right away. With starches and fibers, those are going to be our more, um, longer chains of molecules. And so each of those has to be chemically broken off of this chain. And so that takes a lot of effort by the body. Um, But also the way that some of them are structured in the fibers, they aren't necessarily getting fully broken down in the body and or they might attract more water, which is why if you eat like a lot of fibrous foods, like particularly fruits and veggies, Um, or whole grains, they have the kind of fiber that attracts water. And so that's going to create that more bulk and fullness feeling in your Mm -hmm. stomach versus, you know, eating um, some candy. That's just more the simple sugar. It's not drawing the water in as much. So you're going to feel more full um, and it's going to take more 
work for the body to break it down, meaning it also requires more calories for the body to break all of these bonds apart versus that, you know, singular disaccharide from like table sugar. So that's why, so that's like on the carbohydrate level, but when we're thinking of like, well, why do we, if these are all carbohydrates and they all break down to the same molecules, why is it like, oh, vegetables are good and candy is bad, you know? And I, I don't like that. Like I, there are no bad foods. I eat candy. I have candy dish right on my desk. Um, so that's, I want to make sure I drive that home. Um, but like, why do we think of things this way? And it's because our foods are not typically just one thing. Uh, we also have vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and all that stuff in there. So we want to get a big variety of foods from any category. So if we're looking at um, carbohydrate sources or we're looking at fruits and ve vegetables kind of individually, we really want to eat the rainbow uh, because if we're, if we're saying, okay, it's just about carbs, fats, and proteins, and as long as you're getting enough of those, you're fine. Well, then you could eat literally the same thing every day and theoretically get your needs met. And if I had a nickel for every time someone came to me and like their typical meal was like chicken, broccoli, and rice, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> it's, it's such a stupid common thing. Like that's a fine meal if you like that meal, but it should not be the only thing you eat because we get different vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals from different colors of food. So you want to, you know, change up the fruits and veggies that you're getting as well. Uh, I like to tell people to eat the rainbow. And it doesn't mean that you need to hit the rainbow every day. Like that's, that sounds like a lot. I would not meet that for sure. Um, but like over the course of the week, if you put a little thought into like, okay, I've eaten a lot of green this week, but I haven't had any red or purple yet. Like what can I add in to get that color? And just you know, trying to expand your reach of different colors of foods is really going to help you get more of those nutrients in. Uh, I feel like there's also the question with like pasta and stuff. So when we're looking at like carbo loading, like you were saying about for runners. So, I mean, there's, there's been some updates in science since like have a huge pasta dinner the night before because your glycogen stores still need to get topped off in the morning. So, you know, um, but you can technically get the carbs that you need for your sport from any of those sources. Mm -hmm. But if you're eating enough to go on a long run or make it through a rigorous rehearsal or something, it's going to be hard and probably digestively painful to eat a lot of fibrous vegetables versus some refined flour pasta. Oh. And okay. so it's not saying that, you know, you, you couldn't do it through vegetables, but you would need to eat a lot and they're higher in fiber. And so if your body is not accustomed to that, that's going to cause gas bloating. You're probably going to want to run to the bathroom. It might cause constipation if you're really not used to it. Is that really what you want to bring on stage or on that long run? No. So yeah, that might make for a very awkward run the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I have a lot of people, um, so I, I've worked with a ton of runners and private practice and I used to be a, a distance runner as well. And it's interesting, the things that like feel good for one person versus another. I have a lot of people that, you know, like oatmeal, wonderful breakfast food or food. Um, most people handle it very well, but a lot of people can't have it right before a run because it is a complex carb, it does draw in water. So they're, they're pulling in water that their, you know, other cells need or respiration needs to their stomach. Um, it's very fibrous. So it takes a lot of work for the body to break down. Um, so energy is going to the digestive tract. Blood is going to the digestive tract to handle that digestion. And mm. if they're not accustomed to the amount of fiber, they're feeling constipated or bloated or gassy. And so 
put that in your body. The first couple of minutes are like, oh, good, satisfying breakfast. And then you start getting out on your run. You're like, oh my God, side stitch. I need to find a bathroom. I'm feeling super bloated and my like running belt hurts. Uh, or with my performers on stage, they don't want to be bloated and not fit in their costume. They don't want to be like in the middle of their dance and like, oh, I need to go to the bathroom you know like we need to think about slowly increasing our fiber intake and considering fiber before the activity um, and I think of this in particularly in performance time like in rehearsals or if you're a runner like on short runs great time to test these out and see what works for your individual body um, it's it's trial and error because not everyone's the same on how they tolerate it um, so if you're, you know, just taking a normal class, like, great, try some oatmeal beforehand, see how it goes. Like worst case scenario, you need to like take a minute out of class to go to the bathroom and come back and you say, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Or I need to give myself more time. You don't want to figure that out on show day <laughs> or on race day. Like that's, that's what's a problem. So I really like people to test out their foods ahead of time and kind of come up with their own show menu for show days that they know works with their body. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> They're great questions. Stuff I don't like think about adding unless someone asks. Uh, we're gonna head back um, over here. So let me, okay. Um, so as we were talking about balanced meal components, so, this, uh, the stuff in yellow that you see here is what I would really like to see most meals having all of these components. Um, not every meal is going to have all of these because no one's perfect and I don't want to stress people out. But if we're thinking about, did I generally hit these categories each meal? Um, that's going to be really helpful in making sure that we're getting our nutrient needs really well met that we're having good balanced meals that aren't too high in any of the different categories, uh, that we're gonna be well fueled with energy. And I actually have a nice little worksheet for this. So um, I can share a link with you at the end of this if you want this worksheet, I can email it to you. Um, but basically it's saying three meals and three snacks a day works for most people. And so I say people kind of tweak the snacks as they want, but this is a great little worksheet for coming up with meal ideas that hit these different categories. So if we look down the left-hand side, you know, we see for a meal breakfast, calcium, grain or starch, fruit or vegetable, protein, and fat. So if you go through and, you know, you're, you got your breakfast in front of you, did you hit each of these categories? If not, what's missing? What could we fill in there? Um, so that can be really helpful in kind of thinking through like, what does a balanced meal look like? Or for like the other question scenario of planning ahead, this can be really helpful in kind of coming up with what do I need to plan ahead for the week for things that I'm packing with me or, you know, figure out what I need to take grocery shopping is just kind of going through and like, okay, this is a meal that I like. Let's break it down into these categories. Is there anything missing? Yes, let's add that in. And kind of going from there. So I'll give you an example with this. Um, so I think everyone knows what pizza is. So I like to use that as an example. This totally fits in here. So um, if we are breaking down our pizza to see if it fits in here. So calcium, do you have cheese or if you can't have cheese, another calcium equivalent, grain or starch, that would be the crust. Fruit or vegetable would be the, you know, if you're doing marinara sauce, and then if you're adding any fruit or vegetable to your pizza topping, so, you know, you've got bell pepper, pineapple, whatever you're doing there. Protein, uh, depending on how much cheese that can count towards the protein, or if you're adding uh, a meat or a meat alternative, there's your protein. Fat. Um, it's probably coming from cheese, and if there's any oil used in you know, baking it or cooking the meat or vegetable ahead of time. Uh, so that, that's our pizza broken down. And then fun food is anything goes. So this depends on what you want that day. It could be an apple, it could be a brownie, it could be a little baggie of chips, it could be literally anything you want. But I think it's important to make sure you have foods that also meet pleasure. 
That's all that works. Yay, I heard pizza and brownies were good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to continue on. So now that we've learned all of that stuff, uh, another question that was sent was, I'm very concerned about maintaining my weight as a dancer. Is there a best diet I can stick to? Uh, as I said, if it has a name, you probably don't want to go with that diet. So there's that. Um, and we want to, you know, look at all of those other aspects I just talked about having balance, having, you know, um, balance, macro, micronutrients, throughout the day, all that kind of stuff. Um, for me, the concerning part about this is maintaining my weight as a dancer. So, I mean, that could mean a lot of different things. That could be like, I'm at my perceived ideal weight. I wanted to stay here. That could be, I fluctuate a lot. How do I not fluctuate? This could be, I'm underweight, need to you know gain. It could be, I feel like I weigh too much and I want to lose. So that, that, doesn't really tell me a lot other than the person probably has not the greatest relationship with their body and food. So bring in the uh, binge restrict cycle. So this is what I, I like to ask people is just take a look at this and do you feel like this is something that you fit even on some level? So as we're going around at the top, we have Binge, overeat, do bad, fall off the diet, whatever you want to call that, which inevitably will lead to shame, guilt, self-loathing, insert feeling word, which leads to restricting intake or dieting or, you know, swearing you're going to do good, it could be purging or over-exercise, which is going to lead to hunger and or deprivation which of course is going to lead us to eat more than we plan on, which could either be an objective binge, it could be overeating, whether truly or perceived, or falling off the wagon, eating the food we said we were never going to eat, uh, whatever that is. I would say most people fall into this cycle at some point in their life. And the part that most people seem to feel is the problem is that stuff at the top. They always want to know, well, society wants me to look a certain way. And I know among dancers, it's particularly bad. Anyone in the public eye or on stage, um, and especially ballet dancers, but I would say all, all types of dancers are in this. Um, there is a perceived ideal body type, which I know there's a lot of um, talk and body positive movements around this. So I'm hoping this will start to shift and change that people all don't have to fit into the same costume size and things like that. But what it's really doing, um, having this perception of needing to fit into a specific size is that it is pushing people into this cycle even if they weren't there before or it's amplifying it. So, where this really starts is at the bottom and where we need to break it is at the bottom. So if someone's like, oh, I need to lose weight, I need to fit this body type, they're probably doing one of these or multiple of these things on the bottom. And it could start with, you know, the more innocent, I'm going to do better today, I'm going to eat more vegetables and less whatever. And, you know, that might be a, you know, smart choice in the instant. But if they're not fueling themselves to their body's actual needs, they're going to be probably hungry. And if they're not allowing themselves to have certain foods, so I think of like any of these diets. So if we're talking about, you know, low carb diet or even something like, I'm not gonna eat sweets anymore, or I'm not like, so many people don't wanna eat bread right now, which is just fascinating to me. Like bread is so amazing. Uh, so like they say, I'm not gonna have this thing. So they're feeling deprived even if they are technically eating enough calories. So this can happen even if you're technically getting enough intake, you can feel deprived. Or if you're not eating enough, you're gonna be hungry, which is going to lead to overeating because our body has biofeedback mechanisms that keep us from starving and dying. So we're gonna eat. And again, even if we have technically consumed enough calories up to this, if we're depriving ourselves of things we really love, 
we're going to go crazy with it at some point when we get access. It's like saying, you know, don't think of a penguin. What did you just think of? A penguin. Right? So you say, oh, I don't eat brownies anymore. You're sure going to be looking at all the pictures of brownies. <laughs> and whenever you see one in a store, on a friend's plate, at a party, whatever, that's going to consume your brain. You're not going to focus on conversations happening or whatever else is happening. It's going to be just zoned in on there's a brownie. I can't have that brownie. Better not have that brownie. I'm so good. I don't eat brownies. You do that long enough, you're going to snap and you're going to overeat it. <laughs> and it could look like overeating on brownies or something that I used to do when I was in a restrictive eating disorder was, oh, I'm going to be really good and not eat the brownie. I'm going to eat these carrots instead. Mm, I still want the brownie. That didn't do it. Okay. Well, I'm going to have a you know a healthy dinner. Still want the brownie. Okay. Well, I'm going to have an apple. I still want the brownie. I go in the kitchen, eat half a pan of brownies. <laughs> like, again, that's another one. If I had a nickel for every time I heard someone tell me a similar story to that, like it is so common because we tell ourselves we can't have the thing that we really want. If we had gone back to the beginning, when you first had the inkling, I want a brownie and you ate a brownie, you would have probably been satisfied with one brownie and you would have gone about your day, not overthinking it and not eating half the pan of them. Yes. Are we saying something? No, it's, it's true. I've done that with other things. <laughs> yeah, right? So it, it's so common and I want to, I bring this up because I think it's something that's not spoken about. People just say, oh, I should have been stronger than that. And that's not what's happening. It's that you're stuck in this cycle because that feeling of, oh crap, I ate the brownie whether it's one, because you're not allowing yourself any, or it's the whole pan, it's going to lead to feeling that shame, guilt, self-loathing, low self-esteem, whatever, because you supposedly weren't strong enough to keep going. And we don't have infinite willpower. It, it doesn't work like that. So whenever we tell ourselves we can't do something, we want it more. So again, if we just allowed ourselves to have the thing from the beginning or in the more extreme versions of, you know, restricting, dieting, purging, over-exercising, if we don't put ourselves in this place of being so extreme, we're not going to feel hungry or deprived. And then we're not going to do the thing that we perceive as bad. And then we're not going to feel bad about ourselves. And then we're not going to need to do these things that are on the bottom of the cycle. So really the way to break the cycle, no matter what the behavior is, is working on stopping the stuff at the bottom of the cycle. This is something that, you know, depending on what the issue is, this could go a lot of different ways, which is, you know, why I work with people individually and why, you know, there are professionals, dietitians, therapists that do this, because it can be pretty difficult to overcome on your own if it's something that you're really stuck in. But I think the first step is really acknowledging like, this is where I am. This is the part that I need to work on. So if I stop doing these things on the bottom and that can be hard, like, it's not just like, oh, I, I know better. I'm going to do better. Like it can be hard, which is why you work with professionals. But if you can stop doing those things on the bottom, it's going to break this whole cycle and it's going to improve your relationship with food and body image so much. which leads into another question we got about eating disorders. Um, so this again was a really specific question that I can't answer specifically, but it's, I've been a dancer for 15 years and have battled eating disorders on and off throughout, gotten treatment for it, but I still struggle. How can I get over this? Uh, without knowing the person and the details, I can't fully answer that question, but just some kind of general things I would think about is, you know, kind of their individual needs. Um, I mean, obviously, if they're going to be a client, we would look into individual assessment of that. But generally, if there's if they've been, you know, working on this for 15 years, you know, it's not something they're probably going to just get over. Uh, so finding ongoing professional help, whether that is going to a higher level of care and like really just getting into it for a while and, you know, making that their sole focus for a while. 
or if they're appropriate for it, having ongoing outpatient level help. Um, it's really important to keep that recovery mindset top of mind, particularly, um, you know, skipping to the bottom of this, the influences in your life. If you're around a lot of people who are pushing this type of behavior, if there's people that are, you know, constantly on you about, you know, your looks or diet, or they are doing disordered eating or dieting, or you're in an environment that, you know, is, is very, um, weight centric diet culture that might be something that needs to change maybe it's not the right space for you and I think that leads into this you know middle chunk of looking at what really matters to you if it's you know hopefully they want to recover um is it the environment you're in that is making it difficult to fully recover for some people it's environment for some people it is genetics and it's going to be far harder but if it's something where you know, the dance environment is making it more difficult. Is it dancing in general and you're just so self-competitive that it's not a good fit for you? Or is the studio or style of dance or the other people on, you know, your competitive team or in your class or whatever are triggering to you and, you know, causing problems? maybe that's something where you need to switch to a different class or studio or style of dance or take a break for a little bit and kind of reassess. Um, I, you know, obviously I'm here because I love dance and dancers. So I don't want people to just quit. Like that's not what I'm saying, but it's not always the right fit for people or at this time or in this exact way. There are lots of options. Um, so if that's something that is continuing the eating disorder, uh, I would just, you know, take some real personal reflection time on that. Maybe talk to a therapist and see, you know, what's going on there, or maybe home life is really hard and that's making it difficult and, you know, moving to a different living situation can be helpful. I mean, there's, there's so many factors in eating disorders that without knowing the individual, it's hard to say, but these would be some of my initial thoughts. Okay, so um, I could go on, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop and see if you have any other questions. I don't, no. I feel like, oh, I've been talking for an hour. No wonder, or am I, I'm like out of breath. <laughs> I need to get my sea legs back under me. I used to teach three hour lectures like and keep going. So it's been a while. <laughs> No, it's very helpful. I feel that there's, there's so much nutrition information that's out there and you don't really know what to trust because yeah, is it sponsored by a certain diet or a certain company or whatever it is? And so thank you for really the science, the science behind it. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for letting me eat whatever I want. <laughs> Yes, thank you, you for letting me say that pizza is okay. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Mine's not uh, brown, red. Yeah. <laughs> but still, yeah. Here, I'm going to throw uh, my website link in the chat if you are interested in taking a look at that. Um, I also have a podcast called Permission to Eat. Um, and of course, my book. So you can find all of that on my website. Oh. more but yeah I love delving into the science and I think that's the thing that really sets um, dietitians apart from other types of nutrition professionals whether it's nutritionists or doctors like we have learned the science behind what happens to the food in our body and how it affects us and it's not just you know eat this don't eat that it's like how does it actually work and that's that's why this is a medical field <laughs> you know it's it's a science as well as an art, just like dance. Like there's a science and an art to dance and there's a science and an art to food and eating. And I love both sides of it. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for letting me go. Now I'm hungry.